I'm John Sawyer, um, the Executive Director of the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting in Washington. It's wonderful to be here, and I want to first thank Lonnie Isabel and, and the Cooney Graduate School of Journalism for uh, hosting this uh, important event and, and making this facility available uh, to us. And Cooney is, is a leader in innovative forms of journalism, and in that we think that they are, are good partners for what the Pulitzer Center is, is trying to do as well. I want to say at the beginning that because of the, the nature of the panel that we're having today and, and some of the sensitive issues that are addressed, uh, that there should be no photos. We ask that no photos be taken uh, during this event. Uh, we are making a, a recording that we will edit uh, with care, but, but, but no additional photos um, as, we, as we go through, through the discussion. We have a lot of ground to cover today. We thought that we would begin with a, a short clip uh, from our Live Hope Love uh, project. I should say, parenthetically, before I say that, before we begin, that also I want to thank the Mac AIDS Fund, which has been our partner in this uh, enterprise from the very beginning, two years ago, and made it possible for us to do all of the work that we've done on HIV AIDS in the Caribbean. So the, the piece that you're about to see is just a couple of minutes from one of the uh, poem slideshows I call it Nicole from Live Up Love. <coughs> Nicole. How coolly it has broken me, trying to mask the knowing wit behind your eyes. Every smile, brilliant against your gleaming black skin, is defiant. You stammer, push out words, tell your story, Slap your knees to show where your stroke frozen body would crawl across the concrete to reach the yard with the gawking onlookers. You laugh, man must live, man must live. How casually broken. Tall, lanky man, hands clawed, yams dangling, and the sweet club man's charm in your grin still. All those women slain by your arm. You stretch out your legs, tell your story slow, persistent as the crawl you made towards sunlight. The way you pulled your body upright. The way you made tender the toughness of hard men who would soon wash you, feed you with oily fingers full of mashed ackee and tomatoes, who have held you against the night. Men tough as teeth, hard men. Man must live, man must live. The virus stalks through your blood, manages to tickle, make you laugh at a new sunny day. And yours is the posture of survival. Well, not, not to bury my lead for those of you who haven't heard, but this website, Live Hope Love, uh, won an Emmy last night uh, in the news and documentary. <laughs> There are new approaches to um, making news and documentaries. And if you go back a couple of years, two and a half years ago, when, when Nancy and I first talked about this project, uh, I was well aware, as all of you are, of the tremendous work that Mac AIDS Fund has done over the last 15, 20 years. Millions and millions of dollars on HIV AIDS prevention, treatment, education, and so on. And what we were talking about really what was an experiment to look at a media program, which, which Mac Gates had not, had not done at that point. And we were a very new organization. We started in 2006 at the beginning uh, as a nonprofit journalism center trying to bring attention to underreported issues around the world. And as Nancy well knew in our discussion, that HIV AIDS in the Caribbean was precisely that kind of issue, was that kind of issue. There was a lot of attention in the media paid to HIV AIDS in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, but com comparatively little to the Caribbean, even though the incidence rates in the Caribbean um, compare, come very close to what you see in Sub-Saharan Africa. So the mandate to us was to see what we could do in journalism uh, to, to bring more attention to this issue. And Mac AIDS, to its credit, understood that we were an autonomous uh, journalism organization, that we had to have control of the, the work that was done for it to have integrity for, for us to get placement for it. And so we did, uh, we've done several projects now. The first two focused on Haiti and the Dominican Republic and 
led to a website called Heroes of HIV, and also public television videos and newspaper and, and, and schools outreach. The second project, we wanted to do uh, something a little bit different to um, engage people not in a, in, a, in a less traditional journalism way. And we ended up commissioning Kwame Dawes, who you'll hear from shortly on the panel, who is the poet in residence and English professor at the University of South Carolina, Jamaican, Ghanaian by birth, um, expert on reggae, uh, author of some 20 books of, of poetry, the co-founder of the Calabash Literary Festival in Jamaica, but not someone who had previously written at, at any length on HIV AIDS in, in that country. And so we had a discussion, and Kwame, uh, somewhat gingerly, I think at the beginning, agreed to, to, to take this on, and made a series of trips to, to Jamaica in the fall of 2007. Five trips in all, interviewing some 50 or 60 people touched by HIV AIDS in a variety of ways. Everyone from, from novelists like Rosie Stone to, to doctors and teachers and uh, people uh, living with HIV, living with AIDS, uh, their survivors. And we sent down, I went with him the first time, Natalie Applewhite, our students, before our associate director. Uh, his, background, his background is a video documentary. Went twice more with Kwame. We sent other videographers with him. We sent a photographer, we sent a web designer, and at the end of this um, several months of work, uh, Kwame had a rich array of material that we used to create this website. We also created a, a couple of pieces for uh, the public television show Foreign Exchange with the death of Fareed Zakaria. Uh, we, we placed long essays in the Virginia Quarterly Review and the Washington Post. Uh, the News Hour featured it. Uh, we then created a one-hour radio documentary out of all of the material that's on this on this website, and the took that around the country. And then we it was recognized as a, a Knight Batten winner last year for innovations in journalism. Uh, this along the way, Kwame had also said that I think this this piece really lends itself to a musical spoken word performance, and I think that that you know all of our funders. The, Bulletser family, who are the main funders, principal funders of the Bulletser Center, as well as Mike Gates and others. So this is kind of getting far afield from, from traditional journalism. You're commissioning music, you've commissioned poetry, and you know, where is this headed exactly? And so we, but we went ahead with that and, we, and, and commissioned the music by Kevin Simmons, who had collaborated with Kwame on, on previous projects. That then created music that is on this site, original music, and a, a performance piece that we took last month to the National Black Theater Festival, which is the, the premier festival every other year for black theater in the country down in North Carolina, and brought this subject, this issue, to, to a whole other audience. And of course, last night at the Emmys was our opportunity to, to bring it to yet another audience, the, the kind of elite uh, news media audience. And, and this is very much, this is, this project is what the, the Pulitzer Center is about at its core. It's trying to find new ways of engaging people, people who are not otherwise engaged in issues, and bringing them into those topics. And um, we're tremendously grateful to, to Mac Aids, to, to Kwame, to, to all of the, the incredible artists, performers, the people in Jamaica who work with us to, to, to allow us to, to tell this story. Now, flash forward a bit more, and, and last spring we're, 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 we're talking about AIDS again, we're trying to continue this work, and we want to we want to do a project on homophobia and stigma that's going to look at that issue more narrowly, which is, as many of you know, a huge, huge issue. And so for that project, we commissioned uh, Mike McFink, who you'll hear from shortly, a uh, documentary producer who had already done the wide angle of uh, piece on Angola and AIDS, and many of you may have seen several years ago, a wonderful piece. And he brought in Gabrielle Weiss, a videographer who worked with us on several previous projects. And then we brought in World Focus, which was WNAT's new initiative as of a year ago to, to, to create a, a nightly a half hour program devoted exclusively to uh, foreign affairs and, and to try to build an audience for it. And, so World Focus agreed to partner with us and through us with Mac Aids 
uh, to produce this uh, series of series of videos on on the subject of homophobia and, and stigma. And what we'd like to do is show you just one of the clips. It's going to start running tonight uh, on World Focus, and they'll have I guess tonight is tomorrow night. I should just say Lisa Bajati is also here, who is the producer and uh, on air correspondent uh, for these segments for uh, for World Focus. So we'll show one of the clips, one of the five clips, and, and I hope that you all will watch it on World Focus and see it. I'll come back later and we'll talk a bit about what we've done on our website to, to make all of this material available. Uh, but in the meantime, let's show this and then we'll assemble the, the panel and begin the conversation. four men dressed as females narrowly escaped a mobbing in downtown Kingston. Just last week a male was beaten in Falmouth at Trelawney because he was dressed as a female. The issue of violence against gay men, especially mob violence, is definitely a reality. Stacey Ann Jarrett is the executive director of Jamaica AIDS Support for Life, where she works closely with Jamaica's embattled gay community. If it's an individual, you will have verbal attacks, but you will necessarily have physical attacks because it's one-on-one. -on -one. But if it's a group, I'm telling most definitely they're going to be attacked. While photos like these showing a mob attack on a cross-dressing gay man are rare, individual reports of violence are common. Two weeks ago, a two-guy in the machine nearly killed me. These gay men agree to appear on camera as long as their identities are concealed. Once they find out that you are gay, Batman, let me use the word Batman, they want to kill you. Because people have, have been beaten, people have been chopped, people have been forced out of their communities, people homes have been burned down. I've had to respond to the calls late at night, early mornings, throughout the day when I'm at my job. Carlene, who asked that her last name and face not be revealed, runs the hotline at J Flag, the main gay rights advocacy group in Jamaica. JFAC was formed to say, well, we're going to be the organization to stand up and, you know, let people, let the world know what gay people has been facing. As far as um, straight Jamaicans are concerned, once you're gay, you have no place in this country. We shouldn't be here, we shouldn't exist. For Representative Ernest Smith, a member of Jamaica's ruling Labour Party, the very existence of JFLAG is an offense to his country's laws and moral codes. Yeah, yeah. I am very concerned yeah, yeah. that homosexual in Jamaica have become so brazen. Yes. They have found themselves into organizations. Yes. They're, they're on the street. In fact, they're abusive. Yes. They're violent. Yes. And something that the Minister of National Security must have. JFLAG is in fact an organization designed to disrespect the Constitution and the criminal laws of this country. And at the same time, designed to corrupt public morals. In Jamaica, we have on our static books the criminal offense, which is referred to actually as the abominable offense of buggery. And it carries up to 12 years imprisonment. You cannot consent to buggery. We're not saying that gay people should be obliterated from the face of the earth. We're not saying that. My government has never said that. My government will never say that. And nor am I saying that. But because your behavioral pattern is in breach of all decency, guess what? Keep yourself to yourself. Do not try to impose your filth on others. Don't force others to accept you and your faith. Gay people in Jamaica always have to hide because, you know, uh, once you're discovered to be gay, that could mean the end of your life. That's not true. They're lying. They're just seeking, they're just seeking um, um, publicity. Representative Smith, like many people here, believes that most reports of anti-gay violence are simply false. Persons in Jamaica are not, without more, attacked and beaten, and as you say, killed by reason of being homosexuals. Most homosexuals are killed by other homosexuals because of jealousy. Ernie Smith saying that there's no violence against you know you know against the gay community. Um, that's just a 
way of escaping the reality of what is really happening. It's a very convenient excuse of, for, for, for doing nothing. And not only for doing nothing, for turning on and stigmatizing the very group that is being attacked in the first place. Dr. Robert Carr, the executive director of the Caribbean Vulnerable Communities Coalition, says that many Jamaicans believe that gay life should be violently suppressed. For some reason, they've decided that it's acceptable to be abusive towards gay people. This video, shot at a gay birthday party two years ago, triggered widespread violence when it was released on the streets and appeared on the nightly news. This next report shows just how disturbing the trends have become. Believe it or not, these are all males. This footage has been circulating on the internet, a clip of men cross-dressed at a party. But is it a case where these individuals are not becoming too brazen? One concern is that their mode of dress is deliberate and they are now flaunting it as a normal way of living. This was enough to trigger a level of violence in that part of the country that was really astonishing to watch. We were told that several gay men who appeared in the video were killed, and others, like this young man, had to flee their homes. One of my friends called me and told me that the, the committee where I lived in was planning to gang up on me one day and, and kill me. The society has got to that point where people are astonished that, that onlookers would say this is inappropriate or this is extreme behavior. A lot of gay men and lesbians who are attacked are afraid and reluctant to seek services and are, are to report it to the police for also fear of victimization at that end. If you allow yourself to, to, to direct such venom and hatred against a particular population that people feel it's acceptable to beat them and kill them, you're opening up a Pandora's box that you really don't want to open up. If it was HIV, it was killing us, we would say, okay, it was a condom. What is that? that? It's people you know, they're killing us. If you don't believe that a, that a population has the right to exist, then you could care less if they've got a deadly infection. It doesn't matter if they live or die, because they, no, they have no business existing in the first place. For World Focus, I'm Lisa Biajati in Kingston, Jamaica. <coughs> so, and that's what we're facing. That's what we'll be talking about in these, in these videos that you'll be seeing over the next you know, several nights and weeks on, on World Focus and on the website as we, we try to distribute them further. Our role as journalists, as we see it, is to try to engage people in, in issues such as this that, that demand engagement and debate and open discussion. And when people get engaged, and if you do the journalism right, they get engaged, they then will want to come to, to people. There's lots of materials, lots of expertise out there. Much of it is right here in this room. So, so this is what we're doing this afternoon, where we're, we're, we're Micah and, and Kwame as the journalist on this panel, but also the experts that, that we'll be hearing from. We're talking about you know, how you bring the, the knowledge and the information that people need out to the broadest possible public. So with that, let me invite the panelists to come up. And Julia Greenberg, the Associate Director of Aid Free World, who I know most of you know well, uh, will moderate the panel, and, and then we'll, uh, I'll come back at the end. Thank you.